The first step in workflow and process improvement is to build cohesive teams to conduct workflow and process mapping of current, sometimes called as-is, processes. These should be comprised of the people who actually perform the process. Workflow and process improvement for tasks performed by staff must include representatives of the staff actually performing the work. It is especially important to ensure, for example, that every nursing unit or every department or every person involved in a flow of a process is involved in some way. There are variations in work, sometimes needed and sometimes not. In addition, one of the biggest issues with workflows and processes are the handoffs between processes, between departments, nursing units, and people within a given work unit. Workflows and processes performed by physicians also need attention, and again, especially at the handoffs, or frequently lack thereof such handoffs. It is especially difficult to get physicians involved in this work. But physician informaticists, department heads, members of quality committees, and others with a propensity for organization can often be recruited to help both review maps developed by trusted staff members and to gain support from their colleagues. The biggest naysayers or complainers can often be challenged by such physicians to participate in a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. Sometimes supervisors or managers attempt to take on the task of workflow and process improvement because staff are busy performing their work. But managers and supervisors rarely know the nuances of how processes are actually being performed. They end up frequently mapping workflows and processes based on how they think they should be performed, not how they are actually performed. The result is that issues existing in current workflows do not get fully recognized. Managers and supervis supervisors should support workflow and process mapping, ensure that bias and blame are removed from the activity, and encourage people to identify all the warts. Because healthcare facilities so often have such fiercely independent departments, a workflow and process mapping activity can quickly turn into a confrontation if this is not managed well. Some organizations have contracted consultants to perform process mapping and in some cases have lost the benefits of the aha moments it can provide. A consultant can be helpful in training people to perform process mapping and ensuring that the maps are of sufficient detail to aid identification of improvements. If used to supplement a large mapping task, the consultant should assure that stakeholders still play an important role and that they are not introducing their own biases for how they think processes should be performed. If using consultants to help implement health IT, for example, they can offer guidance on how the IT is intended to be used, but should not force processes on people where there are still better alternatives. Many organizations are starting to post maps on whiteboards or walls in staff areas where all can contribute as time permits. Computer groupware can also be helpful, including to introduce computer use to new users, of which there still seem to be many in health care. Those working in health care, and especially clinicians, are rarely trained in workflow and process mapping. The second task, therefore, is to orient the stakeholders to the purpose of workflow and process improvement. If using workflow and process improvement to introduce new health IT, it can be helpful to use a tool such as the five rights that originally was used by the Institute for Safe Medication Practices to describe the five rights for medication administration. That was the right patient, right drug, right time, right dose, and right route. These would be the need 
in our case to capture the right data presented in the right way with the right decision making support with the right work processes and ultimately to achieve the right outcomes. Translating these rights from either safe medication practices or right computer systems to right workflows and processes in general should focus on things like improving communications, reducing gaps in care and improving care coordination to improve the overall quality of care, reducing physical steps and irritations to improve the overall work environment that is to boost morale, to reduce errors, omissions, and duplication, to reduce cost to the health system at large, and finally to improve the work experience for staff and clinicians and the care experience for patients. It is important to emphasize that the goal of process mapping is to find the right way to do something, not any one person's way or to necessarily change from old to new solely for the sake of change. When using workflow and process improvement in the context of value-based care, caution should especially be applied to focusing too much on improving quality and reducing costs. Now this may seem strange because obviously value equals quality and cost and everyone knows there are many improvement opportunities but constantly focusing on improving and reducing can be demoralizing. Staff may be doing the best they can under the circumstances that exist. The goal at hand, however, is to help improve the circumstances to make their work easier and more enjoyable for them, and value will follow. Staff should also know that literally everything is fair game. No stone will go unturned. If it is staffing load, hours worked, number of patients on a unit, issues with roles, nursing unit layout, EHR issues, or whatever, all must be considered in the workflow and process improvement activity. The third step is select tools. There are a variety of tools that can be used to perform workflow and process mapping. Although vendors implementing health information technology often have a preference, organizations doing workflow and process improvement for value-based care or to address other issues can select whatever they decide fits them best. And this potentially can include use of different tools to fit different types of workflows and processes. The most common tools are, are illustrated on this slide, and we're going to discuss each one of them briefly. But in the course of this lecture, we're also going to use several of these tools to illustrate specific points about workflow and process improvement. One tool is a process diagram. These are used where the focus is on materials and people and where there are few handoffs from one person to another, from one department to another, one entity to another. They are easy to construct and highly illustrative of various detail, but contain little room for narrative. They are probably the least commonly used tool in healthcare workflow and process improvement, but they are very common in other industries, hence included here for your reference purposes. The swim lane process chart may use the same symbols as the process diagram, or the systems flow chart we'll be talking about in a minute, or simply boxes. This tool permits the arrangement of steps in a process into rows, like swimming pool lanes, that describe who or what department or entity performs various tasks in the process. This can be useful for spotting duplication of work, delays, and bottlenecks. The chart here is one that has been automated by the Utah Quality Improvement Organization and is called Health Insight. Flow process chart is one of the oldest tools available. While it may at first appear cumbersome, 
It incorporates process design symbols that can be checked off for each narrative description and it usually also encompasses some measurement of units of work, time, and other factors. Those who prefer narrative descriptions over pictures like this tool, often including physicians who are not inclined to draw boxes or follow flowcharts very well. When combined with a before and after or as is and to be chart, it can be extremely effective in explaining new workflows and processes to others. The systems flow chart, also called a value stream map, is typically used when incorporating information flows, such as is the focus of mapping workflows and processes associated with health IT. It is the most common tool used in all of process mapping today and is used by many health IT vendors, of course, as well. Although all the tools may be supplemented with additional documentation, the systems flowchart frequently is supplemented with narrative descriptions and with decision tables when there is complex decision making to be depicted. While these formal tools can be helpful and can be created using automated charting tools in many cases, content is more important than format. And in fact, many have been successful giving sticky notes or post-it notes to people to write tasks on and then sequence them on a wall or large sheet of paper. The sticky note can be used upright to designate a process and tilted to designate a decision point which are the two primary parts of any process. Since process mapping takes time and it is often difficult to remember every task performed, giving everyone a sticky notepad and having them write down tasks as they are performed can be a quick and accurate way to start the process. Different color notes can help identify variations in how different people units, etc. perform the same process. Perhaps it's obvious that this is my favorite tool to use when I aid people in their process mapping activities.